Bienvenidos a un capítulo más de Diálogos Sensoriales en la modalidad itinerante. En esta ocasión eh, les quiero compartir una plática con la doctora Hildegard Heyman. Ella es una especialista sensorial altamente reconocida en el mundo. Seguramente la van a ubicar por su eh, libro publicado junto con Harry Lowles, que es la evaluación sensorial de los alimentos, principios y prácticas. El libro de evaluación sensorial más conocido en el, en el mundo, sin, sin duda. Y bueno, la doctora nos comparte todas estas vivencias desde sus comienzos en Missouri hasta actualmente sus planes para, para qué, qué hará. Entonces, pues eh, los dejo con, con esta plática, que espero la disfruten eh, de la misma forma en que yo la, la disfruté. Bienvenida, eh, doctora Hillard. Thank you, thank you very much for accepting this uh, interview, this small chat with, 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 with us. Thank you for asking me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, well, I, I, I will uh, start with, with, with this conversation asking you, uh, why sensory? Why did you decide to study sensory and where? Okay, it was, it was an accident. I was a um, undergraduate in viticulture and enology. I wanted to be a winemaker. A female winemaker in the 1970s in South Africa was not a thing. So I worked for a while in a research uh, winery, but I really wanted to be a winemaker. So I decided probably naively that if I had a master's degree, then maybe they would hire me as a winemaker. So I came to Davis to do a master's and I worked on a fermentation project uh, on succinic acid and red wine. And in January of 1980, long time ago, um, <laughs> my roommate, Laura, who was a food science master student had to take a sensory class for her degree. And she had been told that it helped because she did things, the labs in pairs to have somebody you trusted. And all of her cohort had taken the previous year because she had gone skiing for 10 weeks. So she worked on me and worked on me. I didn't have to take this class. I had no interest in this class. I didn't have to do this. It was not my thing. Um, anyway, long story short, in the end I agreed if she did the dishes for 10 weeks. And so I ended up in Rosemary Pangborn's 107 food science technology class, sensory evaluation of food, totally not knowing what I was walking into. Okay. And about five weeks into the 10 week quarter, and I absolutely vividly remember this, it was in room 107 Cruise Hall. She was talking and suddenly I looked at her and I went, that <clears throat> is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Oh no, how, how, how? And to make a long story short, I had to go back to South Africa. I had to figure out the finances. It was a lot of stress, but eventually I came back to Davis and I did a PhD actually not under Rosemary, but under Anne Noble. And I'm one of those lucky people. I did exactly what I wanted to do that day in that class. It, it, wow. it just, worked and you know looking back so many things had to go right at so many different places for this to work but it did wow yes and and uh, it, it looks like uh, most of the people who, who are doing sensory uh, it's just by chance i mean they they start mm -hmm. arrive to the correct place at the exact moment and they start developing their own skills with with that right right and and you, you mentioned at that time not so long. Uh, it, it was difficult to, to, to the people to, to learn and, and to, to, to acquire sensory knowledge. And yeah, there were not very many places in the world at the time. I mean, you pretty much had to come to Davis. Uh, Cornell had somebody. There was somebody at Missouri. And there was a couple of people in other countries. But it was only... So Pangborn started teaching the first sensory class ever in 1960. So it was not that long, you know, it, it, it's, it was very close to the start. And in actual fact, my PhD dissertation has a descriptive analysis of wine in it, which was published. And that was the second descriptive analysis on wine. The first one was by Anne Noble about a year earlier. And it was only the fifth descriptive analysis on anything. Wow. So, you know, As I say, I'm older than dirt. So I was there at the beginning for many, many things. And that makes it more exciting and more interesting in some ways. Totally. 
And how how was that first encounter with with uh, with with your masters? I mean, with your PhD. I mean, the 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 thing that you start dealing with with descriptive analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, were you convinced with the? Well, I was. So well, so as I say, it was the second one ever, right? Anne had done one in uh, in England on uh, Bordeaux wines. And so there was nobody to teach you how to do it. There was the instructions that uh, Stone and Sajal had written in their 1974 publication. There was a couple of other things, but there was no way of knowing that I was even doing it right. So I was training a panel based on what I read in paper. And I was terrified. I mean, I was absolutely terrified. But the data actually made sense because I also had some flavor chemistry data and it matched. You know, we were not that good at the time about all the stats we do today, but the, the small things that I could match matched really well. But I was still, I was still concerned, to be really honest. So I then went to Missouri as an assistant professor in 1986 without a postdoc, which was also problematic because I went from being a student on the 15th of June to being a faculty member on the 1st of July. And I had students who were older than me, and I didn't exactly look that old, so it was all very complicated. But I love descriptive analysis. I love the idea of it. And so we did a lot of descriptive analysis in the next few years. But I had questions. I had lots of questions. But I very carefully did not ask any one of those questions out loud until I got tenure at Missouri, <laughs> which, <laughs> yes. which point in the early 90s. I set out to break descriptive analysis. I set out to figure out if this actually works under whatever. And we did it by using the same products and different training methods, the same products and different people, um, different languages, different, uh, uh, different uh, literacy levels. I mean, we, we did everything we could to break it. And quite frankly, as long as you have good reference standards that the panel agree says the words that they believe as long as they had seen all the product so they knew what the size of the differences were and as long as they want to be there to do this you really can't break it correct yes and sometimes people is not uh convinced that i mean i mean the panel leader they are like, okay, I don't know that product, that maybe the panel is not uh, so sure of that. So yeah. that's something that, that people yeah. must work on it, right? Yeah, no, the key is the key is reference standards. And those reference standards have to match what the panel talks about, which means you can't use words. You have to use things. Right, correct, correct. Wow. So uh, how, how different is the descriptive analysis since uh, your very first so my first uh, up to now uh, yeah but i think descriptive analysis itself hasn't trained hasn't changed um we still do it the same way to be really honest we still do it the same way but what has changed is some of the rapid methods that have come in and and the use of those rapid methods now i'm very much a traditionalist when it comes to sensory science i really believe that there's a difference between consumer sensory and analytical sensory and i have a real um, concern when we start using CADA, for example, on consumers, because we're now mingling the two. And the big problem is words. Words have meaning right. and words have different meaning to different people. And now we're asking consumers who are using words very differently to tell us something. Now, if you use enough consumers, 100, 150, 200, you probably get some numbers that make sense. Right. Problem with using 100, let's just say you use 100 people. First of all, you've got to find the 100 people. Secondly, you've got to get them there. Thirdly, you may have to get them there twice or three times. Fourthly, you need to have product for 100 people. It is a huge amount of time, money, and product. Whereas I know that using 12 people that's trained, I can probably get better data, essentially faster, with less stress. So I still very much, I'm very doubtful. And if you look at the, the size of the differences, yes, you can get differences with Kata, with consumers, with lots of people, but you can't get very subtle differences. And sometimes the subtle differences, especially when you're dealing with alcoholic products, are the more important things than the big differences. 
you know, if you do research on liver paste, right. probably not such a big deal to see the small differences. You're dealing with tequilas, you're dealing with gin, small differences. So I am still very much of the belief that we really, really, really need to not muck up the consumer and analytical part. Right. Yes, it is. The, the issue is when people start doing 12 consumers and rapid methods, right? No, yeah, then you've got real problems. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, nobody wants to listen to me. I'm old, but no, no, then you have not. real problems. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, okay, wow, I, I have a lot of questions. I, I received many questions mm -hmm. from, from our, our, our colleagues, but uh, I, I will, I, I, just one question about how were your, your interaction with Anne Noble and Pangra? Uh, okay, um, really good. I mean, these two women were totally different from each other mm -hmm. and they were totally different from me. So, <laughs> you know, I my re relationship with Pangborn because she died so young, never really went from being a student professor relationship, although it was a, it was a warm, easygoing relationship. Um, Pangborn was very formal uh, mm -hmm. most of the time. She was <laughs> very much Professor Pangborn, but she also had the foulest sense of humor you could possibly have. And apparently in Spanish, it was even fouler than it was in English. Um, so her, when she had Spanish graduate students, they always said, oh, the jokes. And, and, and every so often she would have one in English, not very frequently, but free. So that was a, it was, she changed my life. So I would always, always have that. But she was more formal. She was more bang board. Um, yet, and this is not, this is something I've actually never talked about in public. I've only talked about one person to this. Um, after she passed away, her husband, Jack, gave me an amber necklace that he had given her <coughs> when she got her honorary doctorate at the University of Helsinki. Okay. And he said to me, she wanted me to have it. And so for about 35 years, I had it and I wore it once in a while, usually for a professional event. Wow. And then about five years ago, I started thinking I needed to give this to somebody to the next generation. Right. Wow. And so I went through the next generation and eventually I gave the amber necklace to Helena Hopfer, who okay. is um, at Penn State. Right. And the story, so she wore it at the gala dinner at the uh, Pangborn in 2017. And she came up to me and she, and she did this. And I said, oh, it's beautiful. It looks great on you. And then apparently shortly after I left that night, the thread broke and all of these amber beads were on the floor. And she hysterically had everybody right. at the table scrabbling around <laughs> to pick them up. Wow. wow. <laughs> so I'm hoping that she will give that to somebody 35 years from now. Wow, great story about so that. So that was my Penguin interaction. My interaction with Anne obviously started out as a student faculty interaction. Um, and then over the years morphed into a true fit friendship of equals. Um, we are very different people. We see the world very differently. We respond to things very differently, but fundamentally we are very similar sensory scientists. I can't hear you. Sorry, right. And uh, then um, how, how, how much of, of their personalities you absorb it and now use to, to uh, teach with? I probably have more of Pangborn's personality in the sense that I want things to be organized and thought through and done. And, and is a little bit more scattered, wanting things to be more organic. Uh, but from a teaching point of view, I think I'm probably more me than either one of them is probably the way to put it. I, I want to, to arrive to that point because, uh, well, I, I will skip a little bit the, the, the time, mm -hmm. but, but I, I, well, you, you have been uh, teaching several countries. I mean, right. in, in right. Mexico, in, in South in, Africa, uh, Copenhagen, uh, it's Seoul, you, yeah, lots of places. Yes. <laughs> how, how, how easy is that? I mean, how, uh, which, uh, which country is, is the, or the culture is the most difficult 
to teach um, in that sense? I don't think it's really cultures. I, if what has been the most difficult, quite frankly, was the first quarter of teaching on Zoom when COVID hit, uh, because the university told us we could not ask for uh, people to turn on their cameras. And so I literally taught sensory to 60 squares, 60 black squares. Correct. And with no feedback. And it turns out that I do best when I can see people, when I can, can feel the room, when I can realize, oh, I've now gone too far this way. I need to go back and explain it again. But if you have 60 black squares, you know nothing. Uh, and so that was probably, quite frankly, the most difficult teaching I've ever done. Never mind the fact that it felt like the world was blowing up and all the other crises that was going on at the same time. From a teaching perspective, that was incredibly difficult. And I've never had that. You know, even in, in countries where people are not very outgoing, there's always one person who responds. Right. As long as there's one, you, you can figure out what's going on. Yes, well, at least one. And, and um, how easy was for you to, to start with sensory after you, your study? I mean, um, so, okay, so I got a position at the University of Missouri. Uh, my predecessor had retired about two years before. She uh, had, she was actually a home economist to become a sensory scientist. And she had gone, actually came to Davis for a quarter to take Penguin's class in the 60s. So she had a very strong sensory background. She mostly worked on microwaves and NutraSweet and very interesting things, cakes. But she was gone by the time I got there. And so I really started from scratch. I needed to move into a new lab. I was lucky I inherited her um, lab manager or lab tech, or whatever they called them in those days. And Mary was really good about showing me where the problems were. And then I just Try, I just started, you know, I just kind of basically took Pangborn's class and made it mine. And I had talked to Pangborn about this and she was fine with it. And looking back, those first years were not that great, but you learn. I mean, the, the thing is with university faculty, they teach us our field, but they don't teach us how to teach. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher I am today and the teacher I was in 1986 are probably two totally different human beings. But slowly but surely I found my feet I found my voice I think that's probably the most important thing from a teacher's point of view is you need to find out who you are and where you are most comfortable and in which ways that translates into teaching um, and I like things organized I was actually working this morning on my lectures for the fall they're all done I'm just uploading them and it's still two months away but wow. that's the way that's <laughs> the way my life goes I can't do it at the last minute but other people can and, and it's totally personality driven. And I've come to the conclusion that if I'm organized, then things can change, you know, on the fly, I can go off into a different direction, but that's okay. I knew where I was supposed to go. Understood. What was the most difficult product for doing sensory in your case? Oh, probably the most difficult product for me personally was boar taint. Now, as you know, um, if you have intact male pigs, they have androstenone in their fat and wow. some people are not sensitive to this at all they don't smell it uh, some people smell it and they say it's floral some people smell it and they say ah, it smells like a man's locker room or gym socks <laughs> or something and then there's a subset of us who find this odor vomit inducing literally okay i smell it and i get sick wow and we had to do a study on vortex <laughs> <laughs> First key wow. was to come up with a way in which we could give these this product to the to the panelists without the other guards spending the entire day in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, and we did. We finally came up with a way. We actually froze the fat, and then under the fro in a froze in a freezer, a walk-in freezer, we would walk. We would cut up the fat into little one centimeter, one centimeter squares, put them into petri dishes that were labeled with rigid codes freeze the whole thing. And then as the panelists came in to do their studies, we'd stick them in the microwave for 10 seconds. The mm -hmm. panelists would pick up the thing, they would smell it, close it, rate it, next one would come. And under those conditions, as long as I stayed away from the sensory booths, 
we could actually do the study. So for me, that was the most difficult because personally I had such a huge visceral negative reaction to this order. Wow. <laughs> okay. And that, uh, well, you, you are, you, you consider yourself uh, an enologist, right? Uh, yes, I, I, I teach uh, winemaking, so <laughs> I do. And, and, but also you do sensometric. Yes, yes, so. I, I, I teach, I teach in the fall, I'm a winemaker and I teach winemaking. In the fall, I also teach sensometrics, so I'm a statistician. And right. then in the spring, I tend sensory evaluation of wine, and so who knows what I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of sensometrics, why? I mean, uh, normally uh, people tend to, to be scared of statistics. So why you like statistics? Or I how? love it. I, yes. love, I love the fact that you can take a ton of data and make sense out of it. Um, now, keep in mind when I started, Sensory scientists produced the largest data sets in the food science arena by far. We had huge data sets, right? Right. Today, of course, we produce little TD tiny data sets if you took, to talk to the geneticists and the genomics and the metabolomics people. But at the time, we had these huge data sets and we had all this data. And as Anne used to say, looking at a, a data table is like looking at your taxes. There's no, it makes no sense. And then you can take that data and you can put it into a PCA or a CVA or as time has gone on an MFA or whatever. And suddenly it made logical sense. It made sense based on what you knew about the product. It related to the chemistry of the product. It takes chaos and it makes it organized. And I like organized. So I guess that's why. Okay, yes. and. Um... Do, have you uh, perceived this change of mentality of the students that they like more statistics or not? They are the same. They still scared of statistics. Uh, when I teach the sensometrics class, I teach it every year or I had, and then I skipped for a few years and now we're going back to it. I usually have 10 to 12 students in there and I would say one of them are just totally, okay, this is great. The other eight or nine are like, <gasps> I'm never going to survive this. And yet by the end of the quarter, I try so hard to make it accessible. Um, I mean, the key for this class is for them to walk away having done each one of these techniques once, whether it's on R or Excel stat, depending on uh, their backgrounds and their needs. So that when they have to actually do it for their dissertations or their theses, they could actually just go back and, and plug in the right numbers. Similar to the thing I did at Veracruz with you guys many, many centuries ago. Yeah, no, no, not so long, not so long. <laughs> yeah, I remember that class. Seventeen years. Seventeen <laughs> years. Wow. Yes, I remember that training. It was awesome for me. I, 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 I finally understood how uh, PCA can be interpreted. How can you yeah. measure things with multivariate analysis? Yes, I, I, yeah. I, I adore. And that's what I try to get. I mean, I try to get them to that point where they're comfortable, and mm -hmm. that where they understand if you can interpret a PCA, you can probably interpret every other multivariate. Thing out there. You just need to think about what happened to it. Um, and so I try to make it, it's not a stats class in the sense that we don't go into theorems and we don't go into uh, al algorithms or anything like that. We very much go with when do you use it? Why would you use it? Why would you not use it? And what do you get? And what do you need to think about before you start going ahead? And this is how you do it. So it's very much a how-to rather than a stats class. Right, because you have the tools you've mentioned. There are right. programs that they can run all the tests. Right. There's no need to do it by hand anymore. Right, most of the times. Most of the times, and, and keep in mind when I first started, we actually had to take them down to the basement for the mainframe, and it was a lot more complicated than it is today. Do, do you have a, a memory teaching, like uh, I don't know, a, 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 a study or our research that that? point you in, in a direction of, oh, this is really, really amazing. This will refresh sensory or something like that. Um, maybe not directly. I mean, I the thing about it is I've done so many things that eventually ended up changing things, but I wasn't necessarily one who did the changing part. So two stories on that one. I had a colleague in Missouri, Pu Hong She, who was a uh, agricultural engineer. He worked on extrusion. And one of the things he wanted to do was he wanted to create an extruded product 
that had the texture of chicken breast. And so we did a lot of work for Puhong on the sensory side of this. So this is just extruded product, doesn't it got any flavor, it's cornmeal and water, and maybe mm -hmm. salt. But we eventually came up with a product that was chicken breast in terms of its texture. And then I left Missouri and I came here and I never thought about it again. Fu Hong and his lab manager uh, got a patent on this um, somewhere in the early 2000s, which then they sold to the company that is now Beyond Meat, which is a vegan plant-based meat company, meat in quote company. And that was their first product, was this thing we had worked on in the early 90s. So, you know, so long time later, it came back and you can now buy this product on the store. Wow. Uh, when I first went to Missouri, I wanted to work on wine food pairings. And at the time, there was a set of three papers by uh, Tobias Nygren, who did it for his PhD in Sweden. But that's it. Everything else was blows, blowing smoke. So we mm -hmm. did two studies. One we published, oh, actually, we did three studies in the end. One we published, two we didn't for various reasons. And then suddenly other people started working on this. So suddenly there was a whole new field where we sort of pushed it. Uh, a number of years ago, we worked on minerality and wine. Again, a one-off for us, but suddenly there was a whole bunch of people in both um, New Zealand and Burgundy working on this. Right. So there's been a number of places where I've sort of done a little bit and then somebody else has taken it on. And I've loved those because it's kind of like, oh, here's my baby, you go make, it's big. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, um, we we well we will now practice a little bit of sensory, something like preference, mm -hmm. preference. So I will I will ask you some uh, two choice decision, and please feel free to answer one of them. Mm -hmm. Red wine or white wine? Either. Uh. <laughs> Sparkling wine for the win. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, tetra test or triangle test? Triangle. City or forest? Forest. Traditional descriptive analysis or rapid methods? Traditional descriptive analysis. Breakfast or dinner? Breakfast for dinner. <laughs> Frequently in my house, we had <laughs> we actually had scrambled eggs and, and mushrooms on toast for dinner last night. Wow, great. Yes. We also have that also. Um, analytical testing or consumer testing? Oh, analytical testing any day of the week. <laughs> we are currently, as I'm sitting here, doing a million consumer wow. test in my lab. And the amount of chaos that consumers have, and my personality, I'm in my office. <laughs> no, no I, I, I'm analytical any day of the week. I understand why we need consumer testing. I, and I have done my share here and there. I try to minimize it. Luckily for me, I now have Julian Delarue in the office next to me, and he's a consumer sensory scientist. Guess what? I send everything his way. Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, meat or fish? Meat. Uh, vegan or not vegan? Um, I actually have been vegan at one point in my life, not currently. Uh, for me, it was very difficult from a uh, blood iron content point of view, so I couldn't actually continue. Right. I love the idea of less meat. Okay. Uh, PDF or published books? <sighs> for things that I'm going to read once, PDF. For something that I need to hold on to, published books. Okay. Thank you for your answers. Okay, um, let, let's move to, to another part uh, because time flies. I didn't realize. Okay. Uh, no problem. How, uh, in your opinion, how sensory evolved in the recent years? I mean, so we have gone the rapid methods and I see the point of them. I am concerned as we are adding, you know, when we started with sorting and napping with no words, mm -hmm. I was more comfortable. Now that we start adding words, words have meaning. People <laughs> don't mean the same thing. It's problematic. So I, I that's where my concerns are. Um, we've definitely, and I can see a point for those. We've done some rapid methods prior to doing descriptive analysis when we say have 80 products and we know we can't do descriptive analysis on 80 and we 
to sorting to cut them down to a more manageable number. I wouldn't want to make million dollar decisions on rapid methods, but I can make smaller decisions probably. Um, I have real problems with this whole emotion thing that we are doing these days. Right. Not so much, it's for two reasons. One is we have no idea what emotions are as sensory scientists. We need to work with people whose work this is, and we are mucking it up big time. The second thing is, if you, I just did a study in which people were asking me, there were 10 wines and we had to do emotions, about 20 emotions on each of these 10 wines. I can tell you, it didn't matter what sequence you gave me those 10 wines in. By the end, I was ticked off. That was the only emotion I had. Because how, do I feel carefree when I'm drinking wine? Do I feel startled? No, I am drinking wine. So for me, I think you don't get a lot of information. I think you tick your panelists off. And we don't know what we're doing. So I have real problems with that one. The other thing that has become very useful, and I really think this is a place to go, is some of this immersive technology for consumers. Uh, as I said, I have Julian Delarue next to me, and he's just built an immersive room, which should be online in about another month. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. I think the whole context area is something we really know from a consumer perspective is important. Right. And this will give us the possibility of doing this. I think we're going to get much more from this than we get from all the emotion research out there. Right. It's pretty much the same, but uh, 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 what can we expect then from, from sensory relation in the next future, five, 10 years, if you can realize I, something? So the reason I'm laughing is about 16 years ago, I gave a talk, a sensimetrics talk in Norway on the past, the present, and the future. And I predicted things for the future and not a single one of the 10 things I predicted <laughs> happened. Okay. About a week ago, I gave a keynote speech through Zoom for the new Indonesian Sensory Association. Okay. And they had also asked me to talk about the past, the present, the future. And when I got to the future part, I put up the slide from Norway. And I said, 16 years ago, this is what I predicted. And how many of these things happened? And the answer was none. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I am not a futurologist, so I have no idea. I mean, the whole context thing started with Karen Hine, Karen Lusk's PhD thesis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, although we knew before context was important, we didn't know that we could actually create it. Uh, the whole emotion thing started somewhere, I don't know. The rapid method thing has been coming since free choice profiling and sorting and things along those lines, but I have no idea. I, 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 know, I, I know. I would love to be around to see. <laughs> <laughs> but I probably won't. <laughs> yes. No, I, 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 that's a tricky question. I mean, it's just to, to explore what yeah. we are expecting. Yeah. Uh, speaking about the people who do sensory, what will be if there is any, uh, the minimum methodologies uh, that uh, a sensory scientist must, must, uh, must have? I think a sensory scientist still needs the full toolkit. I think they need to understand human differences. I think they need to understand analytical testing. Uh, they need to understand consumer testing. They need to understand difference testing. And they need to know when and where they can use what mm -hmm. and what the statistics tell them. So I don't think that has changed. I think if you go back and you read Pangborn's book from 1967 with Amarine and Russell, mm -hmm. everything in there, just updated, is still right. what we need, wow. even 60 some years later. <laughs> So, uh, and, and about statistics, is there a minimal statistics for the very beginning? Absolutely, they need to have a thorough understanding of analysis of variance, and ideally also covariance analysis, and then a basic understanding of at least three or four of the multivariate tests techniques out there, so that they know what they're doing and where they're going. Because otherwise, if you only know, say, one multivariate technique, then everything is a nail and you use a hammer for anything and it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Right. Let's say we, we can build a time machine mm -hmm. and you can travel uh, at the time, exact time you are deciding to go for sensory evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something you, you can tell to, to Hildegard in the past about what to do? I think what I would tell Yildegard in the past, especially in February of 1980, 
is that it will all work out. Okay. Because that Hildegard wasn't so sure that it was going to work out. There were so many things that could have gone wrong at so many levels. And yeah, I would go back and tell her, it'll be fine. Perfect, great. Um, do you have a, 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 of course, your book, I mean, your book is, is uh, it's a, 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 a first way to start sensory, but do you have a sensory paper poster that suggests to the people who is starting in sensory? It depends on what they want to know. I wrote a paper a few years ago called A Personal History of Sensory Science, which was probably the most difficult paper I've ever written mm -hmm. uh, because it had absolutely no data in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm a scientist. I write with data. I'm not a you, humanities person who writes history papers. <laughs> It was very difficult to write. It took about six months, and I think there must have been 20 drafts at least. And finally, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a Spanish professor, and he wrote about science in medieval Spain. And I was like, I had no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. And he sat down, and he, he asked me questions. And then about an hour later, he sent me what ended up being the first paragraph. And once I had the first paragraph, the rest of it happened. But so that paper gives you a grounding of where sensory is from my perspective, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, I would probably tell them to read the book because it's a good place to start. And theoretically, <laughs> there's going to be another issue of it in about a year. So okay. maybe that's a good place to start. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, just for, for, for the closing uh, part of the, of the interview, uh, what what are what are you planning to do in of course this new book? But uh, is there something in the, in the in the part of teaching another uh, training or something? Um, so I am actually planning on doing a sabbatical next year, oh, okay. uh, 23, 24. and I'm hoping to go to places I've not been. Um, right. I'm sort of starting to get a list together. And I'm hoping that those things will spark some ideas, what sabbaticals always do. And right. we'll see what happens after that. Great. Professor, many, many thanks. I, I really no enjoyed problem. having this conversation. Uh, I, well, time flies. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's incredible uh, when, when one is uh, enjoying the conversation. Do you have, uh, I don't know, a contact or a page uh, where? Uh, um, I love to get emails, and I am probably the only Hildegard with an E, Heyman with an <laughs> two Ns on the internet, I think. Uh, but H H E Y M A N N okay. at ucdavis.edu. Great. We will put this uh, yeah. email for, for everybody. And uh, is there something you can, you can, or you want to add to this uh, conversation? It was fun. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, and I, I, I guess our our viewers also. Let me close this uh, uh, part, and, and we I, I will come back to you. Muchas gracias por por habernos eh, acompañado. Espero que hayan disfrutado esta conversación. Eh, les eh, recuerdo que nos pueden seguir en, en en YouTube, en nuestro canal, en nuestras redes sociales, y bueno también en, en plataformas de podcast en dado caso que, que quisieran estarnos escuchando por ahí si les gustó den like, compartan comenten y si no, no digan nada nos vemos en la siguiente emisión de Diálogos Sensoriales, hasta luego